Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I am Mary McVie coming to you from the University of Buffalo. And uh, before we get started today, just a couple of announcements. Uh, we do have a revised call for the positioning theory uh, conference this summer. We're issuing a second round of, of calls for um, proposals. And so uh, those new calls for proposals um, we'll put the link in the chat, will be due March 1st. We've also decided to maintain the in-person conference at the University of Buffalo campus in Buffalo, New York, but we will also be adding a, vir a virtual conference and that conference um, will, be, will be staggered. You can find the uh, description of how that's going to work in the uh, in the link that's 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 being put into the chat for you, and if you have any questions, of course you can uh, you can reach out. But we will issue that second call for um, proposals. Also, just a reminder that we have one more talk in our virtual talk series. Um, Luke Van Langenhove will be doing our last talk this spring. You do need to register separately for each of those talks, and so that's um, also something that we will put into the, um, into the chat for you. Uh, and just a reminder of those, um, of those links that you can sign up for, for, future, um, for future conferences. I think at this time, uh, we'll turn our attention to today's talk. Um, we are very excited to have um, Bo Alessu Christensen with us today. He's an associate professor at Aalborg University in Denmark in the Department of Communication and Psychology. He holds an MA in philosophy in the science of religion and a PhD focusing on experience and economy using philosophical and psychological perspectives. Before joining Aalborg University, he taught at Aarhus Univer University in the departments of philosophy and the Danish School of Education. He has published within different areas from media studies over, ex over experience economy to cultural psychology <laughs> using mainly philosophy and or psychological perspectives. Welcome Bo, um, and I'll let you introduce um, the title of your talk and your focus today. Okay, thank you, Mary. Let me just share my screen. Let's see. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mary, and uh, thanks to everyone uh, joining this uh, this talk. As Mary said, my name is Bo. And I'm associate professor at Aalborg University, Denmark, in the Department of Communication and Psychology. Uh, my talk will be about positioning theory, Harray and Wittgenstein, and especially about Harray's understanding of the late Wittgenstein in uh, posthumous work by Wittgenstein called Uncertainty. So it's a bit like uh, John Austin once remarked that there's a place where you say it and there's a place where you take it back. And I'm gonna start immediately by taking it back. Uh, uh, I won't be talking that much about position in theory in the, in the, in the beginning, but we'll end up uh, thinking about or asking you to discuss with me what some of the implications of Rom's, um, let's say, interpretation of uncertainty could have for positioning theory. Um, so all of this is actually in a uh, continuation of an ongoing research interest of mine. Uh, understanding the influence, and some would say, probably say the missing influence um, uh, of the kind of philosophy carried out in Oxford and Cambridge in the 50s. Uh, the influence I'm looking at is, is uh, on the way we think, how the, these thinkers, uh, the, the way they thought about language, and, uh, et cetera, and how that, in a certain sense, influences the way we think about psychology uh, or the human mind. And also, this is the environment which um, 
Hare arrived in from New Zealand and where he took his philosophy degree with uh, John Austin and later also joined us uh, as a lecturer. Uh, and it, initially, if we take kind of like a very broad view, we can see the influence uh, on position theory from the uh, self same John Austin in the notion of speech act, which are part of position theory. And then another uh, Oxford philosopher called Peter Strawson uh, on the focus on the individual. And of course, Wittgenstein, though from Cambridge and not Oxford, in the focus on rule following, uh, or in the parlance of today, we would probably say normativity, uh, what Rom sometimes describes as the normative orders uh, also. So let me just say a little bit about the, the references I'm using. Um, the talk is built about around around these uh, references, and in particular, the first two. Uh, so you think the talk leaves out too many premises, which inevitably some talk, a talk is, is bound to do. You might want to check uh, some of these uh, articles out. And uh, the first two, if they are on unavailable, you're welcome to contact me and I can send you a digital version as well. But notice also here that, uh, that Hare actually made a whole book with Michael Tissor uh, on Wittgenstein and psychology. This is a very good introduction to, to thinking about Wittgenstein and, 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 and psychology, but it doesn't unfortunately address the issues I'll talk about here today. So let's move on to the agenda. Uh, the structure of the talk will look something like this. And I think depending on how much speed I get up to, I, I think it will take around 35 minutes or something like that. So we will have plenty of time to discuss our thoughts. Um, but the structure of the talk will look something like this. I will first say a little bit about why the focus on Wittgenstein and Hooray is important, according to me. I will then give, uh, move on to giving, to give a, a, sh a very brief overview of Wittgenstein research delineating some differences in what contemporary researchers take as the Wittgensteinian approach. This would then be related to Hare's general use of Wittgenstein. And I will present what I take as some sort of a tension in, in Hare's understanding of Wittgenstein between what could be called a therapeutic and an edifying or foundational sense of, uh, of Wittgenstein. However, uh, Hare's later work uh, emphasizes uh, this posthumous work by Wittgenstein called Uncertainty. And here the, uh, he is stressing much more of our, our empirical relation to the world alongside the normative background we connect with the position and theory. And his interpretation there seems to, uh, to me at least, to provide us with a clue of overcoming the, the tension, which I'll come back to. Uh, and in the end, uh, I will end with some thoughts on the meaning of this for positional theory. Uh, mainly, I think that this late Wittgenstein seems to enable us with the possibility of connecting the normativity inherent within position and theory with some sort of empirical or natural relation to the world. And this without being a case of crude empiricism, one could say, um, or perhaps better, without understanding this relation as somehow being reduced to some sort of natural scientific understanding. So another way of putting this would be that uh, the picture uh, uncertainty presents, or perhaps Hare wants us to think about, is that in a certain way we could say that it is norms or normativity all the way down, but some sort of nature all the way up in a way. Um, and after that, I think we can, we'll have some discussions and, and questions, okay. So why is this issue of Wittgenstein and, and Hare important? Um, I've already alluded to uh, Rom's doing research in Oxford in the 50s. Um, Though Wittgenstein had passed away in 1951, his influence can hardly be underestimated. I think he contributed uh, enormously along with John Austin and Gilbert Ryle, both of whom were Hare's teachers, 
to what is called the linguistic turn. Um, that would be something like that our understanding of ourselves, each other and the world, if you will, depends on our capabilities of expressing ourselves. And at the same time, this and at that time, it, it, that meant focusing predominantly on, on language. How, one might say, performing a certain speed act, like saying, I do in a church, um, is engaging in a particular language game um, or discourse, we would probably say today. Uh, a language game involving different expressive capabilities used by different people involved and expressing different kinds of commitments. So all this view on language or our expressive capabilities uh, moved away from understanding language as representing a pre-given world to understanding as shaping it instead. And this probably sounds strikes a familiar note with uh, with many of you who are familiar with the social constructivism in the, in the 80s and 40 and forward. So. But also it's important, kind of like in a parenthesis, to, 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 um, to note that the people involved here um, uh, only wanted to give up at this very crude, empiricist way of understanding the world. They didn't want to give up on the realism of our interaction with the surrounding world. So while accepting language, or more generally our simple using behavior as more constructive than representing, then this wasn't, wasn't to be understood as some sort of, let's call it a frictionless spinning in the void, as the American philosopher John McDowell has put it. The, st the world still had still somehow functioned as an arbiter for, of our, for our normativity. And many of the discussion was, how are we to understand the world as an arbiter for our normativity also? So that was kind of like a, a, a general sense of why it is important because a lot of Harry's thinking, I think, was very much influenced by this in environment and in particular um, Wittgenstein. Um, and hence, uh, we could also make it a more particular point is that Harry's understanding and use of Wittgenstein over the years, uh, also what I in, in the slide here termed alluded to as sort of free waves of uh, incorporating or thinking about Wittgenstein by Harry. Um, overall, I think we can say that throughout Harry's writings, Wittgenstein has always been one of the most important interlocutors. Um, already in the, the early book, which many of you probably are familiar with, uh, he wrote with Paul Secord called The Explanation of Social Behavior. Wittgenstein played an important role facilitating the change proposed by the authors of moving social psychology away from an experimental phase uh, towards a more sociological and cultural oriented psychology. Also in the Being books from the 1980s, Wittgenstein also provided a significant platform here for understanding the role of rules and norms, providing some sort of fine normatively structured grid people use when accounting for their social, personal, physical and emotional being. And finally, in the late 80s and the beginning of the 90s, the discursive turn on psychology he worked out with Grant Gillette, including the simultaneous development of positioning theory, presented Wittgenstein and, and often also Vygotsky as some sort of sidekick or the other way around, as providing the tools for instigating a new view on psychology as well. The aim here was studying cognition and emotion as lived and positioned in and through discourse, understood as including all sorts of symbolic manipulations according to rules. Now, the utilizations and applications of, of Wittgenstein just sketched, aimed at elaborating themes from the late Wittgenstein's main work, namely the philosophical investigations. In the 2010s, Harre turned his attention to Wittgenstein's very last writing, namely on certainty. Um, I think one of the, the last entries in that book is dated two year, two days before Wittgenstein dies or something like that. So this is the, the very last he wrote. Uh, but Harre especially turned to the centrality of uh, the notion of a hinge 
and really the hinge proposition, which I'll come back to later. This was inspired by Daniel Moyel Sherrock's idea of a, a third Wittgenstein. That's what she called the post investigation writings and especially uncertainty presented us with, with another Wittgenstein, not necessarily separate from the first Wittgenstein of the Tractatus or the second Wittgenstein of the uh, philosophical investigations. Probably all there's some continuities here also. Uh, but Harry has sought to inter interpret this hinge-related notions in congruence with his uh, general Wittgensteinian view on psychology. So what uncertainty does for Harry, I think, is supplementing the notion of rule as expressing normative constraints on thought, speech, and act and action with other concepts for expressing the character of normative constraints. But in just, uh, instead of just thought, speech, and action, these are concepts for understanding how what Harriet terms putative matters of facts shape the way we are living. This is the empir empirical relation, which is not empiricism, uh, I mentioned earlier, and which the notion of hinge indicates. So hinges are kind of like different kinds of practices, but these practices are informed by matters of facts. Uh, as you can see, this is a little bit different than when we think about normativity. Now, I also mentioned the tension in, in Harry's reading uh, uh, above. And to make this uh, explicit, I think we need to take a look, a brief look at certain aspects of recent Wittgenstein research. Um, and especially uh, what it is we're doing when we invoke Wittgenstein as some sort of contributor to our research or thinking. Um, let me just take something to drink. In recent studies of, of, of Wittgenstein, it has become common to distinguish between different readings of his work. Often with one side, going back to Friedrich Weissmann, um, the, chair, with the chair which uh, uh, Harry actually got in, in Oxford in philosophy of science in the 60s, um, going back to Friedrich Weissmann and picked up and developed by authors like Cora Diamond, James Conan and the late Gordon Baker, uh, Peter Hacker and many others. Um, these authors claim that Wittgenstein's overall goal is therapeutic. Therapy here consists uh, not in solving our theoretical problems, but rather in dissolving them. That is why, why they consider problems in the first place. Hence, and unlike, let's say, the other, the other side, which I, which I will here adopt a more fundamental approach, Wittgenstein is not seen as presenting so solutions in the form of substantial hypotheses, theoretical claims, or edifying critiques about how things at bottom actually are or are supposed to be. So whereas the latter attributes substantial arguments and views to Wittgenstein, the former claims that Wittgenstein's goal is to turn the reader away from engaging in any theoretical or explanatory endeavor whatsoever, at least in the more radical versions. Uh, and to give you an example uh, of the difference um, between these two, the foundational approach has Wittgenstein advancing, let's call it specific doctrines, often like uh, the use theory of meaning we often connect with the later Wittgenstein. Here, for example, saying I do, as in the church example before, is not representing some once for all factual state of affairs where I do something, but it is actually more pointing towards the different senses of different situations where saying I do is meaningfully and correctly uttered. Um, so they would call, uh, they will make explicit also that there's a difference be between uttering the sentence in the church and answering the shopkeeper's shop question, 
Would you like me to wrap it up? Um, the therapist, on the other hand, would say that this is not entirely what Wittgenstein indicated uh, by claiming that meaning is used. Um, they would claim that the foundationalists are putting forth theories or substantial claims on behalf of Wittgenstein and ignoring what he actually says. For example, in the, in the quote on the, in, in the slide here, it says, for a large class, large class of cases of the employment of the word meaning, though not for all, this word can be explained in this way. The meaning of a word is its use in the language. This is often invoked as kind of like a, as the foundation for this use theory of meaning by Wittgenstein. But as you can see, the modality of the word all in the quote indicates quite obviously that appealing to use cannot explain or describe the meaning of all words. Thus for Wittgenstein and his therapeutical therapeutic readers. Understanding meaning as use is not supplying us with a theoretical explanation, solving a problem, uh, like how to words refer, but it's rather giving us a description whereby problems are dissolved, not by coming up with new discoveries, but by assembling, in a certain sense, what we have long been familiar with, been familiar with like contextualizing as well. Hence, the critical scrutiny of understanding whether we mean what we are saying is a struggle against the bewitchment of our understanding by the resources of language, as Wittgenstein says in the paragraph 109 also. So presenting meaning as use as a theory can therefore prevent us from understanding cases where meaning is established by other means than use. So Understanding meaning as use, the therapist would say, entices us perhaps into thinking that all meaning making can be understood by appealing to use. So the therapist would say, this is not what Wittgenstein meant. We should understand his quote instead as some sort of method for making us, uh, for uh, as a, a method or heuristics for, uh, for trying to, to um, to understand what is happening and to solve any problems about it. Not kind of like a theory which we should put, put forward. But where do Hooray stand in uh, between these two approaches in relation to the notion of hinges important in uncertainty? Um, well, I think there's a sort of a tension here. Uh, uh, but I also think that this tension could be interpreted as if Hooray is making a, a very subtle point, stressing a certain dynamic interdependence between the two readings. Um, for for Hooray, hinges are presented as some sort of foundation, as for example, in the quote here, the, the first quote, a hinge is the unifying something that is manifested in significant pairs of practices and their associated propositions. The latter providing the usually unacknowledged foundations for the rationality of certain practices. Um, so we might say that in the example before of saying I do in a church, the hinges making up a foundation here is all the practices, the putative matters of facts, uh, making up the practices of being together as a couple, having a family, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as well as the institutionalized practices involved in getting married. All these function as a, uh, as sort of hinges uh, on which this notion of I do can be understood up against. Uh, but Hare also presents these hinges as a means of a, a therapy as he makes in the, as presented in the, in the last, the lower quote, he says here that the results of hinge therapy is a kind of a modesty. One acknowledges that one could have been wrong about what one, one took for granted in the com accomplishing uh, uh, the practices of a form of life. So here the modesty claimed is acknowledging that one, what one took as a foundation 
was not really a foundation or not is not a foundation anymore. I suppose to continue the example from before, that if the person in front of you says, no, I don't, then what you took as a foundation of being together, of being a couple or family, as matters of fact, are not anymore. And with it, with it, the actual practices you are engaging in right here and now, uh, right here and now in front of the altar has lost any foundation as well. However, the institutionalized practices of getting married are still there. I mean, it's not like the priest stops being the priest. Uh, so these institutionalized practices of getting married, this kind of hinge, uh, will still serve as a, some sort of foundation for others as well. So claiming that hinges are to be understood as related to a substantial view, the foundational view, and what is supposed to dismantle a substantial theoretical view is a little bit puzzling uh, here. But as already hinted at, there might be more to this than discrepancy. And I think perhaps we can illustrate this by using one of Wittgenstein's pictures from uncertainty. For those of you who want to, it's in paragraphs 97 to 99, uh, where he claims that we can see empirical relations and propositions as akin to a riverbed. So some hinges, with some hinges, the empirical relations and the propositions akin to the river itself, so here on the hinges and articulation of it would be very fluid and fleeting, but some would be more like the riverbed itself that is more firm, but still changing over time. And some would be more like the hard rocks on the banks uh, of the river with almost imperceptible changes. So describing these empirical relations as hinges and using this riverbed metaphor for it, I think we can see that the foundations, uh, it, it is a complex relationship we have with the empirical world, according to Wittgenstein here. Some of it is fleeting and some of it is more firm than, uh, than others, other cases. So let's move on to the centrality of uncertainty. So I think two tasks are left for me to work out now, I'll take it. First, what is this hinge and hinge propositions I talk about, but I haven't really described that much yet. And why are they important? Second, how is this related to the foundation slash therapy description also? I think a significant part of Haray's reflections on the third Wittgenstein and the notion of of a hinge and hinge proposition. And it's important for psychology is because I would say it possesses the potential of bridging the gap between a normative and empirical or naturalist relation to the world or between, we might say a natural and constructivist psychology, but in a specific sense. A hinge connotes the complex non-mechanistic connection of an empirical relation to the world, but understood within a context articulated through the normative use of rules and manipulation of symbols. So we can ask if hinges are the answer, what might the question then be? Well, the question could be some sort of combi combining of the two following reservations against a two empiricist psychology, we should probably emphasize that any description or explanation of empirical circumstances must comply with a normative dimension of language use for identifying these circumstances and what takes place in these. But against a mainly constructivist psychology, I think we should emphasize that the concrete empirical relation to the world matters also. Hence, hinges and their expression in hinge propositions do not, in my interpretation, bring two separate realms together. I mean, the empirical and the normative. 
Rather, I think that what Hinches points to is the fact that within different practices, the empirical and the normative are already related and entangled. So we could probably say that Hinches are some sort of common assumptions, the empirical taking for givens, the firmness needed for the doors of positioning to open and close in a certain sense. I think the quote here on the right actually points in this uh, direction. Here Ram says, hence propositions express in verbal form the effective content of hinges, deeply embedded practices in which the constitutive norms of a form of life are realized. Nevertheless, the grounding of practices in hinges differ from the grammatical groundings in the kind of errors that result from failure from the failure to realize that unlike grammars, hinges have an empirical foundation in the sense that they are grounded in actual ways of acting. So there's a tight connection between the expression, expressing of hinge propositions and the hinges themselves. They are not the same. And the one is much more empirical related. The other is much more normative related. So they're kind of like two, two let's say two sides of the same coin, coin uh, in, in, in a way. And I think we could, the best way to perhaps discuss this or understand it is, is by using a couple of examples. So saying, for example, I'm full might be taken as an example of a rule of grammar describing how to use the word full in connection with personal pronouns. But it can also mean kind of like a very empirical proposition claiming I need no more food. Uh, and also it can, in a certain sense, be, be a, a spontaneous expression saying I have had enough, I'm full. In each case, I think the hinge is something different, despite the fact that the sentence is actually the same. And in each case, the hinges in, uh, in question are taken for granted matters of fact. For example, uh, if I mean by I'm full, I've had not to eat, I'm also this kind of like expression is often uh, followed a compute by me pushing my plate away from me, putting my hands on my belly, and with other people's reacting kind of like naturally towards me as a human being, not needing any more food. Um, another example, which Haray also uses, is that we do not suddenly discover the subjectivity of other people. Rather, we interact with other people as particular individuals with whom we naturally share thoughts and feelings by participating in a form of life. Uh, so we therefore react naturally towards people expressing grief, for example, because we understand what state a grieving person is in. If we discover we were wrong, then we also react accordingly in a natural fashion by changing our behavior. Thus we, and this is one of Harry's point also, we do not kind of like adopt an abstract theoretical attitude, grounding or inferring from some behavioral evidence, perhaps using some something like a theory of mind as a interpretandum to the unobservable mental attitudes of others. Subjectivity is, according to in this example for Harry, not a theoretical hypothesis. Our human lives hinge on it, he claims. We do not infer from people's behavior to their inner lives, since understanding how others feel is, and I quote him here, is a natural endowment, an aspect of the human form of life, a hinge on which our uses of psychological concepts turn. Subjectivity uh, as a hinge is therefore both, we might say, empirical through the natural endowment of humans as a species 
as well as normative through the specific rules, symbols, and expression through which it is expressed. That is, I think, at least the intention behind using it. So, and here it becomes a little bit complex because uh, in my view, Harry actually tries to combine these two readings of, of, of Wittgenstein before. So, so that is why some of the formulations here are perhaps a little, a little strange, but I'll try to explain it. I think we can say Hereda speaks of henches as foundational, but not in the sense that they are once and for all given foundations. Again, think about the riverbed metaphor before. Rather, they come to play a foundational-like role in our lives, some more foundational than others. Subjectivity is obviously, I would say, more foundational than getting married. You, you have an option of being married. It's really hard not to have, it's to say that uh, subjectivity is not an option. It's not uh, in that sense. Um, or at least I would say it is in, here in, in Europe. We could imagine different kind of cultures where um, getting married is, uh, is much more, uh, um, what do you call it, important uh, hinges. But hinges can therefore also turn out to be wrong. For example, if a hinge proposition turns out to be false, for example, my expression relating to you as griefing, then one must show some sort of willingness to abandon the foundation on, upon which it is taken to be based. If you're not in grief, my reactions to you must be changed. That's also part of the normative obligation and the connection between normativity and uh, empirical relations as well. So some hinges come to play a foundational role in our lives, but can also stop playing this role. Hinges are therefore, in a certain sense, also ungrounded. They point to the idea that our normatively constrained practices are grounded in a contestable matter of fact. So I would say that Hare actually agrees with the therapeutic reading, but would still claim that the, the solving of a problem, like me realizing that you being full isn't a question of food, but about emotions, serves as some kind of realization functioning in a foundational like way of proceeding or moving forward. Not as a theory, but more as a practical guide. One could say that I have thereby unearth, as Harry terms it, one wrong hinge and allowed another one to serve as a foundation in my form of life. So hinges might therefore be described for Harry as ungrounded foundations, as having the metaphysical role, putative matters of fact come to play in our lives in the dynamic fashion referred to above. Um, and Hare uses the phrase hinge therapy for this realizing. Wittgenstein sometimes uses the word discover, that discover what is taken as a hinge, as grounded in actual ways of action, acting, played a less foundational role in sustaining our forms of life than we thought. So actually that what we took as a foundation was actually ungrounded. So to sum up, um, what I have tried to indicate very loosely here and disregarding a lot of premises, um, what appears to be a certain tension in Harry's thinking, late uh, Harry's thinking about the third Wittgenstein, apparently accepting both a foundational and a fear putting reading of Wittgenstein might actually also be some sort of a force of his reading that discovering what role hinges the putative matters of fact play in our form of life is also some sort of form of therapy showing the ungrounded foundations of our actual practices. As a therapeutic process, it is potentially reorienting ourselves towards these foundations through dissolving or affirming the hold these hinges have in our lives and thereby serving as a new ungrounded foundation in need of therapy. So, but what does all of this has to do with positioning theory? 
Um, that would be one of the questions I would like to ask out here as well. Um, but I think I can indicate at least two cases where this could have a bearing uh, on position and theory. On a brief note, uh, the picture here seemed to me in an obvious but also very mysterious way to capture how the empirical and the normative are connected very literally. <laughs> um, uh, the first part is, I think, uh, where we could say that there's, it has a bearing is that positions and positionings are obviously very empirical relations as well. And thinking about how they are kind of like much more concretely grounded in, in actual practices might open positioning field studies up to involving our embodied relations to the surrounding world, including the handling of artifacts and physical relations to other people. I think Mary has done something in that regard very much. On a more general uh, level, I think positions and positionings could also be taken to be part of forms of life having a natural, not natural scientific and not, not un unchangeable foundation. And I think this might be why the notion of umwelt, these immediate surroundings, uh, plays a significant, but often sometimes a little, I think, unclear role in her race thinking. At least many people haven't actually uh, uh, addressed this uh, yet um, also. So this notion of Umwelt, I think, uh, was coined by an old biologist called uh, von Uxkühl. Uh, and it was coined kind of like, I think, as a way of conceiving animals' dynamic interaction with the surroundings as seen very concretely from the animal's perspective. And instead of describing this interaction as a mechanistic relation between responses and stimuli, inter animals interact with the immediate surroundings in such a way as both to adapting to, as well as trying to adapt to the environment also. So I think, and this is one possible future trajectory I, think I, I will be working on, I think, it, if we kind of like think about this with hinges and propositions and the empirical relations as their relation to normativity also, then the transferred proposition theory and human forms of life, I think it moves us in the direction of understanding of a normative niche, niche construction also. So it's not just on the normative level, but it is on using this biological metaphor of, um, of a umwelt as well, makes us do some kind of niche construction, which is one of the modern of it. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, yes. And ask. Yeah. Go ahead, Bo. No, just ask if uh, anyone has any comments or questions, probably a lot of questions, um, or thoughts on how to, to use this in position and theory. So while folks are thinking of their, um, of their questions, um, you can put those in the chat. If you'd rather ask your, your question, you can raise your hand. We'll try to, we'll try to, um, to monitor that too. And then um, there are a couple different ways you can you can raise those, those questions. Maybe while folks are gathering their thoughts and thinking about their questions, um, thank you both so much for your, for your talk. I see um, Cindy says that was a fabulous talk. I'm gonna ask if, um, if either, Cindy or or Luke, um, if you would like to start us off with any questions um, while folks are thinking of their questions, uh, feel free to to do that. If one of you has a question to get us started, Luke has his hand up. So Luke, thank you. Well, congratulations, Bo. That's a very interesting take, and and it makes me think a lot. So uh, I'm full of questions at this moment. The first one is is on the notion of hinges itself. Um, do you think 
there is any similarity between the Kaufman concept of frame. Can you compare hinges with frames or is it me just misunderstanding? And then the same question would go for uh, societal icons that Harry used as a concept. Do you think we can conceive these as hinges? The second related question, or question to you is, is that I don't think you mentioned the concept of double ganger, which I think in Wittgenstein is very important when he talks about uh, hinges, that he said that we have prepositions that are, and it's untranslatable German, double gangers of uh, the hinge. And can you exp expand a little bit on, on that, uh, please? Thank you very much. Thanks, Luke. To take the last one uh, first, I think the, the thing about the doppelganger, uh, doppelganger is what I, I think I tried to, to explain a little bit by using this "I'm full" as an example, because I think uh, the thing is that the same sentence, uh, Wittgenstein also uses the, the phrase "der gleiche Satz." The same sentence can be used uh, in different ways, meaning and involving different kinds of hinges. So that's a, that's why I think. If I remember correctly, that's what the, the thing about this, uh, about the doppelganger is actually uh, about. Uh, regarding Goffman frames and societal icons, um, I don't think they are the same uh, as uh, hinges. I, I think one should probably ask that if we, in, in a certain sense, expresses a societal icon, or we express something within a Goffman frame, what be, would be the hinges, uh, the empirical relations, the kind of concrete practices um, that these societal icons or the, uh, the things going on within a frame turns on, if you know what I mean. So it's, I think it's much more probably in the virginity of what Goffman would say is a footing. So it is probably uh, where, I mean, if you take that literally, where do you stand when you say something? Uh, what, what, what are you interacting with when you say something? It, uh, also, I think, concretely. Let's take this thing about, again about being at the altar. Um, obviously, the church is there. It has to be there uh, in a certain sense. Otherwise, it wouldn't, uh, they hinge on that. But the like I said, there would be kind of like the whole institutional ritual going on there is part of this footing as well. If I if if I understand Goffman correct in, in in some of this, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. But maybe I leave it to others to ask questions. We can continue our discussion later when you come to Bruges. Yeah. Actually, I have a follow-up question to that, Bo. I mean, do you, how, how would you see, or do you see distinct differences between hinges and footing and positioning that, it, and, and also just in terms of positioning, how, how do hinges relate to positions or positioning and are there different, you know, what are the differences that make a difference? Or are, are there, how did Hare think about those two in your, in your opinion? I, I, I think there's a difference between positions and hinges as well. So I think that in some of your work with, with, with children, when you use the position and us towards it, you come up with saying that, um, that the, we need to address the embodiment, concrete physical embodiment towards the, the world and also including how do people handle artifacts. And I think it's, it, it is this kind of, kind of like an empirical relation, concrete uh, way of handling the, the world that has that this notion of hinges also turns about. So positions could be expressed normatively through language, 
but there's a part of it which are based on this <laughs> uh, embodiment, this concrete empirical relation to our world. It's, it's very difficult to articulate because obviously I have to use language to do it. So in a certain sense, I'm caught in an, in a normative web of, um, of this. But again, it is not, I don't think it is something which is a world outside of us. It is kind of like making manifests from within practices that we have normative as well as empirical relations to the world. And these are kind of like two sides of the same coin. Um, and footing, yeah, yeah. I, again, could you could you tell me what what it is Kaufman means by footing? <laughs> I was hoping you had the answer because I was just, as we were talking, I was recalling that any time I attempted to use positioning theory in my dissertation work, my advisor would always be like, "I think you should use footing from Goffman," and it sent me back to this sort of looking through all of the things. And of course, this was in the this was in the mid '90s, so there wasn't as much yeah. writing. The positioning theory work was relatively new, but I've still I still don't feel like I have a really clear answer to that myself. So I was hoping that you had the definitive answer uh, right there. I like the um, the American philosopher John McDowell who made this book called Mind and World uh, in 19, I think it was 1993 or 94, something like that, that he came up with this expression of the frictionless spinning in the void. And he used that on, on very normative approaches to understanding how we relate to the world, where everything is kind of like normative, right or wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and you can just go on and go on. If you do it right, uh, then the, his point was that there's kind of like nothing. It, you have to, even though you have this normativity, you have to understand that the, there's, there has to be a way in which the world can matter to you, that you can bump into something uh, concretely. You can hurt yourself on normative facts as well as natural facts in a certain sense. Um, so these notions about normative and natural facts I think is also part of what what the hinges uh, are trying to convey by Wittgenstein and and by Rome as well. So I think it would be interesting to ask you, Luke, if 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 this could be some other way of actually understanding the varieties of realism, because I've, I, I'd say it also that that Rom, given his departure in the Oxford philosophy in the fifties and whether this is would be kind of some sort of uh, not new but a, an additional way of thinking about how Rob also thought about realism mm -hmm. in his book Varieties of Realism. Well, indeed, I mean, one of the difficulties in in the work of Rob is that he was apparently convinced that there was no contradiction between his realist philosophy and social constructionism, and mm -hmm. uh, at face value, that's that's not simple to, to accept actually and, and it could well be indeed that the notion of hinges and, and these Wittgensteinian analysis of practices is, is a way out of that uh, mm -hmm. but I think it's not only a question of the empirical world versus the normative that is uh, important but also the, the degrees of freedom that there are at any uh, given moment so I mean, when, when Wittgenstein speaks of certainty that is important issue that we look for things that are certain. But on the other hand, there is also the issue that we all have kind of different capacities to do things and it gives us mm -hmm. possibilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, a very important duality is the one between possibilities, what we can do. I mean, for instance, I could start and sing a song now. I, I wouldn't recommend it because uh, it's be terrible, but at least it is a possibility. And, no, no, nonetheless, the certainty is quite high that I will not sing a song for you here at this uh, conference. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's maybe not a real answer to your question, but uh, it's 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 things that are keep me busy these these days to think about. Have, have you seen both the the, the latest the, the last book that Rome uh, edit, wrote with Jean Pierre Loret, the analysis of practices? No, I haven't seen it. Uh, no, you should, because uh, that, about hinges, uh, the whole book is about hinges and okay. he, he turns it into a concrete analysis. 
for uh, situations that come. Interestingly, positioning theory is not mentioned in that book, although I do think okay. it must be possible to uh, to connect uh, both uh, issues of his work. Yeah. yeah. Look, uh, I think, I think... Book, sorry, could you just repeat which book that you were referring to? Yes, it's a book I... by uh, Harry, Rome Harry, and Jean Pierre Lorette, Lorette with double L in front. And it's published in uh, 2019, I think, yeah, with Cambridge Scholars Publishing. And the title is The Analysis of Practices. I think that's also the one where he uses Richard Sweda's notion of synthetic a priori as, uh, as a way of we engaging with the world as well, I think. That we both come with something a priori, but mm -hmm. also we have this empirical relation to it as well. So again, we have here, perhaps hinges are synthetic a priori. And obviously he's taking that for Kant, from Kant, but I think Richard Schrader in his book on, on on cultural psychology um, uses that as well. Interesting. I see that um, that Dennis has put a link in for that book if anybody is looking for it. Other questions or comments from folks? Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, if 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 no one else does, I was thinking about this notion of the of hinges. Oh, Stephen's got his hand up. So Stephen, I'm gonna let you ask your question if you want to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would just want to react on um, the concept of footing uh, that was mentioned before, um, because I think that this concept of footing of uh, government is. Um, something that can um, make a position and um, the role of position more uh, more clear, because footing referred to the way in which a person is is uh, related to the message he or she wants to give or to to deliver, and um, when uh, the professor ten minutes ago. Um, said something about the use of person pronouns. That's also something very important in the concept of footing, um, because there's a, a great difference in saying I want something, or he wants me to do something. That's that's the different use of person pronouns is there very important, and it makes more clear how the concept of position is used in that particular sense. Because when you say I want to do you something, or in the other sense, and he wanted me to do something that says something about the position you are uh, you are adopting in that particular interaction. So um, I guess there's some um, yeah added value in the combination of the concept of position and the concept of footing. Mm. Uh, thanks for clarifying that, Stephen. I'm not a government scholar. I have to admit. <laughs> so. But but did you have a question or was it just a comment? It was just a comment, but maybe uh, okay. other members here are uh, they working on uh, the concept of footing as well. Mm -hmm. They also want to add because for me it's a very interesting link and especially more if you get it more abroad. Uh, the added value of frame analysis when you use positioning theory to clarify or to um, make more sense of the positions that uh, people adopt in a particular interaction. Yes, and comments are welcome too. So it doesn't just have to be a question if someone else has a uh, response to what, what Steven said or to, um, to Bo in the discussion before too. I have a related question, I guess, and, and, and that is, I was thinking about um, even before this discussion, Bo, as you were talking about hinges and indexical pro pronouns, and also that book by um, Mulhalsler and Hare um, on the um, 
what's it called pronouns we use people and pronouns or something like that yeah, people pe people and pronouns I people and pronouns okay so i was thinking about that in relation to um you know in relation to what you were talking about and hinges and whatnot but it also goes to what stephen was saying Yeah, I think uh, the riverbed metaphor is, is useful, useful here because um, I think at least Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein would probably say that when we speak about form of life, uh, something common to everybody, there would be different kind of degrees of that. So some hinges would be kind of like common to everybody and some hinges would probably be much more local, if I can put it this way. And I think what pronouns and people articulated is that some of these, we usually think about um, emotions or uh, I think it did, didn't Ram use very much the, the concept of honor as very different uh, depending on the different kind of cultural context as well. So, uh, so how should I put this? I, I, I think that that book would be very good at actually articulating some of the, let's say, more hard rock hinges between different cultures, as well as pointing out the differences between cultures. But these different cultures still have uh, still have hinges, uh, concrete, abstract, uh, concrete practices on which their uses of normative uses of language hinges on. So by bringing those out, we can actually become much more aware of where, what, what grounds we all have and everybody else have. If that was what you meant, Mary. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what I meant. I just don't. I just, I, I, I'm just trying to understand like what the relationships are between, uh, between those various things, and so sort of mulling, mulling this over. So I didn't have any. I guess I didn't have any particular, you know, sort of goal in mind. I was just curious okay. what the response was in relation to that. Other comments or or questions? So, so could I could I follow up with I think some of the some some of the questions that have been coming up and and Bo, you you mentioned Mary's work um, in particular, you know, her work in with the engineering club and the artifacts mm. and so forth. And I wonder if and I'm, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll try to frame this question in a way that makes sense. And maybe you two together, Bo and Mary, could, could help, maybe help with an answer, a potential answer or some answers. So if you if you take, for example, you know, some of the work that we've read that you've done, Mary, and with respect to engineering club and embodiment and so forth, and could you could you talk about normative versus empirical relations to the world, maybe using that concrete example and the way a hinge or hinges might play out in a concrete example of children, for example, sitting around a table, engaged in some, some different activities that you've shared, Mary, with respect to engineering. And, and the, the other piece I wonder about hinges is the con when, when we read your work, Mary, we, you know, kids are learning about engineering practices. How how do they don't already understand them the way engineers would? So how do hinges play out as people are appropriating the norms of particular groups? Those are really good questions, Cindy. I don't know that I really know how to answer all of those right now. I mean, I guess one of the things I'm thinking of, and I'd be interested to, to see what Bo what what Bo thinks about this is that some of the hinges, like in this context that you're referring to, which is where children were learning something new, nope. um, oh. engineering, which is obviously their children, so they're um, they're you know different than the adult. Um, than, than the adult engineers, but um the the hinges i think uh, if i'm thinking about this right would have more to do with those embodied practices the things that they are already aware of as children than the engineering sort of content which is 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 is, is where the their novices in this right versus mm -hmm. i would assume for adult engineers there would 
there would be there would be hinges there that go that go to that that river metaphor right as you're talking about bedrock or things along the sides that would be different for adults in terms of their um in terms of their their practice as opposed to the the children i guess the one question that i keep coming back to too is like where might where might hinges be helpful in explaining some of this um in addition to versus uh positioning or whatnot is there a is there something there that's a difference that makes a difference that actually in terms of applying it to research would be helpful in further extrapolating some of those um uh practices i guess and i'm gonna stop here and see if bo has ideas because i'm curious to hear i don't know that i have an answer but but i think if i think it you're right that i think it's it, it is interesting to look at how people learn languages because people engage in practices uh, many years before they actually learn to speak a language also so i think there's there's a ground there for actually understanding that we have many different kinds of practices even as children on 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 uh, in place before we actually learn to speak about them as well i think michael thomas uh, had this example